Hey everybody, um, so in this video I'm going to talk about photo multipliers, which is what this is right here. Um, so, but before we do that, uh, I just want to um, mention where this came from and um, how, I've, how I've got it and why I'm going to take it apart. Um, recently I purchased um, a uh, Ludlum uh, Model 3, uh, very nice uh, uh, Geiger counter. Um, I bought this, it was actually in a pretty sorry state, um, as you can t see it's, um, it's not in the best, con best of condition. Now this actually came with a, um, a Ludlum 44-3 uh, uh, scintillation probe, so uh, unfortunately this was completely shot, it didn't do anything at all, the crystal had been damaged and it also seems that the photo multiplayer, which is used in this, which is this here, uh, it also isn't working at all, so um, so this is pretty much dead. Uh, so that uh, that put pay to that. So I thought um, at least I should uh, take apart the photo multiplier, um, extreme teardown, and uh, uh, have a look at the insides of it. They're they're actually quite a simple um, a simple device, but. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a huge amount of uh, information out there uh, of actually, you know, taking one to pieces. So I thought I'd um, uh, knock this one apart and uh, see what it looks like on the inside, and talk a little bit about how they how these actually work. Right. So what is a photo multiplier? Uh, well, it's a device that uh, converts photons into electrons um, using uh, the photoelectric effect. Um, in addition to this, it also amplifies as well. So, um, what this means is uh, this device can uh, detect individual photons of light, um, or uh, as in visible light, or um, X rays, gamma rays, etc. So, they're quite uh, quite a clever device, really, but work on a very simple principle. So in the case of this uh, particular tube, as I said before, it was mounted inside this uh, Ludlum 44-3 uh, um, probe. Uh, you had the tube and then you had um, a scintillation crystal which sat in front of the tube and emitted uh, light when it was uh, impacted by um, ionising radiation. That created light which was then accepted by the uh, the photo multiplier and then it produced an electrical signal which you can then detect with your um, radiation meter. So uh, a photo multiplier consists of uh, two parts essentially. Uh, you have a photo cathode which is this area at the front and uh, what are called dynodes which are these uh, small little sections in here. You can see little bucket shaped bucket shaped parts. Each one of those is called a dynode. Um, these are all inside a, uh, a vacuum tube so it's completely sealed under a hard vacuum. The photo cathode, this area right at the front, is a specially coated piece of glass which uh, actually allows it to emit um, electrons when it's um, hit by photons coming in from the front here. So photons would come in, strike this glass, and that would produce an electron inside the tube. So a photo multiplier is um, a high voltage device. Um, they operate between around about 500 and 1500 volts typically. Um, the cathode, as I said, is right at this end and the last dynode in the chain, I'll explain this in a, in a moment, um, is the anode. So you'd have um, the voltage that's applied to the tube um, let's say it's um, 900 volts, um, is applied at the anode and between the anode and the uh, photocathode. Now the reason why there is so many connections on a photo multiplier is because uh, there is a number of dynodes inside the, uh, inside the tube and each one of those is connected um, to the supply um, through a, um, a series of resistors which slowly increases the voltage on each of the dynodes. Now typically in a photo multiplier there'll be anything from about 8 to 12 dynodes inside the, uh, inside the, the tube depending on uh, its application. 
So when uh, a photon comes in and strikes the photocathode here, um, that uh, emits an electron, which is then attracted into the tube by the, uh, the high voltage applied to the, the dynodes. Um, this electron then travels down and hits the, the first dynode. Um, once this happens, it uh, creates a, a secondary emission of uh, electrons from the first dynode. So this means now you have uh, more than one electron um, that, that was emitted and is then attracted to the second dynode, which then, when the electrons impact it, it produces more electrons. So you can see that uh, each stage of the photomultiplier slowly increases the, uh, the amount of electrons, where it then ends up at the last, the last dynode, uh, which is effectively the anode. So you have then a, uh, an electrical signal at the anode that you can actually measure, and that allows you to uh, measure essentially an individual photon. So that's all fairly logical and straightforward. You've got the photon coming in, electron is emitted, it then hits the, the first dynode, uh, more electrons come off, hit the second dynode, more electrons come off and it slowly avalanches and creates a cascade to producing the signal. So why do these stop working? Uh, a number of things can um, damage a photomultiplier. Uh, first off, it's a vacuum tube. Um, so if there's any loss of the vacuum through um, mechanical failure or an, uh, some kind of uh, gas leak, then that will destroy the vacuum inside the tube, rendering it useless. Uh, the second cause of failure is uh, a bit more complicated. Um, if the photomultiplier is operated in um, anything other than almost darkness, um, the amount of electrons that are actually produced by the dynodes is, um, is absolutely immense. And what this actually does is cause the dynodes to actually heat up. Now, as they heat up, they will um, start to uh, release gases, which will then be... Um, inside the tube, they don't go anywhere, so once this has happened you have a permanent um, amount of gas inside. Uh, this then will ionise because you have a fairly high voltage inside this tube and um, you'll typically see a glow um, in and around the dynodes where it's ionising the, uh, the gas that's been produced. So this again, uh, because it's become gassy, uh, the tube will, uh, will stop working and uh, obviously you have plain old mechanical failure. Um, you might have one of, these, one of these connection leads break off or, or something like that. So, so uh, what's actually wrong with this tube then? And why has it stopped working? Well, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, I mean, I'm a bit of a beginner when it comes to uh, photomultipliers. I've done a lot of reading over the last, uh, the last few days, so uh, I've learned a lot, but I'm by no means an expert. Now obviously when I first had this I uh, tested it in darkness um, and it did absolutely nothing. Um, I also operated it in um, light as well and there was no, there was no glow, there's no ionisation or anything. Um, it just seemed completely inert. So I have a sneaking suspicion that the vacuum has failed in this one or it's so gassy that it's just not doing anything at all. One other a uh, clue to that is the uh, front window here. Um, normally this is much darker in colour. Um, it's sort of a, a normally a, a, a bronze, bronzy yellowy colour. Um, and you can see here on the video that it's, um, there is a slight tinge to it, but that's nowhere near what uh, you'd normally expect a photomultiplier to be. So at this point as well, I will also mention getters. Um, getters are used inside uh, vacuum tubes. They are a, normally a, a small metal ring that you can see somewhere in the, uh, in the base or at some convenient location, which is um, fired uh, during the manufacturing process after it's been evacuated. Um, and this serves to um, capture any remaining gas that's left in the tube um, and if there is any gas produced during its, its lifetime, the getter will absorb some of it. Um, obviously, it can't, um, it can't capture sort of a catastrophic failure. Um, it's really just to capture um, small amounts over a long period of time. Now, in this particular tube, I can't seem to see a getter at all. 
Um, normally you'll see a metal ring and then a large patch of a sort of silvery um, coating on the inside, inside of the glass. Um, for starters I can't see any coating like that at all and I actually can't see any sign of the original getter either so it could well be that this just simply uh, didn't have one. Right so um, I think the best thing we can do is um, take this apart and um, have a look inside. So what I'm going to do given that this has a moulded um, socket on it, um, these are all um, pins are all soldered in so I can't remove this off I'm probably going to have to hack away the plastic on this end here. Um, inside here, this part, there will be the sealing pip, which is where the gas was um, evacuated out uh, when, it was, when it was manufactured and then sealed off. So underneath here, I should be able to find, find that, um, and I'll either um, uh, cut through it or um, break it off with a pair of pliers, and that will release the vacuum. Right, that was a, a little bit of an effort. Uh, I had to chop, chop away the, all of this base so I could actually get something in there and I just used a, a pair of pliers on the, uh, on the pip and just broke it off. So you can just see, just in there, the glass has been broken away. Right, so I've got the tube here. Um, I've taken off the tape that I had over it while I was um, cutting the uh, the tube open. Um, one thing I've noticed is uh, the front front glass has now gone even clearer than it was before, and I also think in in the centre, just down in here, I'm sure that uh, the uh, first dynode um, had a colour tinge to it. Um, and I also noticed this small um, thing just buried just there. I'm sure that was grey before and it's now black. So I'm actually wondering whether that might have actually been the getter. So I'm just going to pull the glass envelope off. So we can see the uh, the front face of the multiplier tube, and uh, we can see this silver silver covering on the inside, and and this which looks like some kind of uh, conductive paint or something on the inside. So uh, this will be the connection um, up to the the cathode at the front. Um, this silvered uh, section here will be conductive. So looking in at the front, we've got um, a connection just here, got a very, very fine, fine wire, which is actually quite, it's actually quite hard actually, which uh, loops around and then connects onto this part. One of the connections it connects onto that through this here, through an insulated port here, which then comes out and connects to this wire at the top. So I wonder whether this is probably um, a focusing part of the focus, focusing mechanism. Also note that this area here is also shaped. You can see at this point here, it's much shallower than at the back. We also have something I've noticed here. This section of wire is different. It's got a, small, a, a different material um, between, between the connections.
So down at the side here we can see the individual connections to each of the dynodes. One, two, three. And on the other side, we've got one, two, three, four. And this one at the base here, that's probably the anode. Right, so what I'm going to try and do now is um, take out one of these dynodes. Um, I don't really want to take the whole thing apart because I think it looks quite a nice, um, pretty thing to have on the on the shelf, actually. So I think I might uh, try and keep it as intact as possible, but also um, have a look at um, how it's actually constructed on the inside. Um, I mean, obviously the dynodes are all largely going to be the same, stay the same. Um, maybe they change shape as it gets further down. Um, I don't know. Uh, from what I can see here, they all look the same. So I'm just going to try and take take this dynode out here. Um, I should be able to release it off these metal twists here, and then I think it might just slide out. Okay, this is the uh, fourth dynode in the in the series. And you can just see there's obviously some. Obviously, I don't know a huge amount about photomultipliers, but um, that doesn't look like it should be there. So it's kind of a bucket shape, but also there is a small fine wire that's actually welded across the actual bucket area. So that is about about twenty millimeters wide, thereabouts. I'm just going back to the uh, this metal strip, which is actually connected to this top top section. You can see how it's being crimped. and welded to these two connections here. So no idea what that's for either. Right, so I'm just going to check the uh, resistance of the uh, this silvering inside here, just to see if it is conductive. Yes, very. Right, I'm just going to take out the sixth dynode here, this one, because um, we can see a bit further down the chain to see how, how it compares to this one, and it allows us to see the uh, fifth and seventh one as well, and see how they if they differ at all. So we do have the same blackening on these dynodes as well, and then again with the wire, 
very similar to the the other dynodes. This one looks like it might have been getting hot on the back. Slight discoloration there. That must be heat. And the uh, dynodes do appear to be uh, the same, the same shape as well. There's uh, definitely some discoloration on this one. And uh, looking deeper down inside now, we've got uh, that other dynode out. Uh, we can see more of the insides here. There looks to be a, an even bigger discoloration spot on on that dynode there. So I would imagine by the time you got to the bottom, that's going to be quite pronounced. And we've even got the blackening right on the back as well. So you can just see in there black spot on the back. Right, I don't think there's really much use going any deeper into this. I think uh, there won't be much more to see inside. Uh, just more of these probably getting blacker and blacker as you go down the chain. Okay, uh, I hope you found that interesting um, and hopefully I'll see you on the next video. See you next time.